I'm the classy ninja, Donovan Victoria, and I feel kind of confined. Give me a second. Ugh, there we go. And you're watching a 222 production review. Remember that name, everyone. That is someone who is going to become a ninja star one day. I guarantee it. But with that said, hello, everyone. My name is William from 222 Productions, and I am here to talk to you about the American Ninja Warrior Season 12 Semifinal 1 in approximately 30 minutes or less, starting, well, actually about 25 seconds ago. So, um, I, I liked this episode. I really enjoyed watching this. It was... It was it was a bit weird because there was no power tower, um, and I was, it's like all of a sudden I'm like, oh whoa, we're back in season ten. Yeah, season ten, <laughs> when uh, you know when getting the fastest time didn't really have uh, you know that much of an importance. But I will say um, there was definitely uh, a lot of interesting and noteworthy stuff with this episode um, some some surprising clears some uh, big time moments uh, some very shocking uh, falls uh, some some early exits and uh, a lot of stuff that just you know a lot of things that made me go hmm and I'll get to that uh, later on in this review but there's some things that made me think that might affect my uh, predictions for the final round which will be happening uh, eventually uh, <laughs> One thing I will point out is that, um, as I mentioned in my predictions for the semifinals, uh, is, the difficulty is knowing um, who is in which episode. Uh, for example, when I picked my four women, I would not have picked the four women that I picked had I known how they were split up between the two, because three of my four picks were in this episode. So immediately, I'm screwed. Because, <laughs> because I uh, like... You know, unless all three of them got into the top 12, there was no chance of that happening. So, uh, rather unfortunate, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, let's go over uh, over the course. Uh, we're going to start with the striding steps, of course. Off the hook, returns. I still like off the hook. Brand new obstacle in the third spot, clockwork. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lache obstacle, but all three bars are on gears that are all connected to each other. So as you swing, it causes the other two to rotate, regardless of what position you're in. And so this makes timing important because if you release too late or too early, uh, depending on how the gears work, um, you can miss. It didn't take out a lot of people, but it took out enough and certainly some uh, noticeable uh, uh, examples. Um, you don't need, a, you know, it's only a third obstacle. You don't need to take out a lot of people. But visually, I thought it was very cool. And like, you know, as an audience member, I think it was a good choice to put that there. And then another new obstacle, Burn Rubber, uh, which is a take on the type of jumping across the spinning log obstacles, but uh, they're tires and they're offset. They, they go off to a, an angle. Um, so I like the mechanism that they used. Basically, they have cradles underneath um, that rotate it. So it rotates from the bottom. I like that um, because it, uh, it, do, it for safety reasons, basically, that you don't have the long axles going across that could potentially harm the ninjas if they were to fall. So I like that. And uh, visually, I think it was, a, it was a nice looking obstacle. It was challenging. But at the same time, not impossible. I, I enjoyed the visual representation of this obstacle. Uh, five was sideways once again. Um, they did change it a little bit. Uh, for the slider portion, they re removed the handle, and now you have to actually grab both sides. Um, I, I maintain that it's not a very good obstacle. I still don't like it. It took out no one. Visually, I don't care for it. And honestly, for the level of ninja, I don't think it was very difficult. But that's just me. Uh, I still don't like it. Of course, uh, season episode six. Uh, wow, <laughs> obstacle six. It was the wart wall. Uh, seven was the salmon ladder, and then obstacle eight was the uh, obstacle design winner corkscrew. This obstacle I really liked. This was, uh, this was a good argument for winning the obstacle design contest. Basically, you got three, ha uh, three handles. They're the traditional valve, full wheel turn handles, but they're facing down. 
You grab them, and as soon as you grab them, they start to drop and spin you around. And you have to be able to hold on and not get flung off. Throughout this entire episode, my only thought about this obstacle was, what happens if someone just let goes in the wrong way and they go flying off the side of the course? <laughs> I'm thinking about like a sort of like cartoony way, like almost sort of like ragdolling off the course, be like, woo, just go flying. <laughs> now, clearly they thought about this as a possibility because if you look, the sides were anchored with just big, thick padding uh, to prevent people from falling on the sides of the tank. It never happened. Despite the, the many falls on Corkscrew, it never happened. And I was, I'm not going to lie, I was slightly disappointed. And I honestly think that, like, you know, maybe that makes me a terrible person for hoping to someone to get flung off at the course. But I'm not going to lie that the masochist in me who grew up watching shows like, you know, MXC, a.k.a. Takeshi's Castle and other stuff like that, wants me to see it happen every once in a while. <laughs> Reminds me of that one time, uh, one season where like a guy just fell off course and onto the concrete. On one hand, I'm like, ooh, ah, ooh, that, that looks like it hurts. But at the same time, I'm like, <laughs> he fell off the course. <laughs> uh, that's funny. But I really like Corkscrew. Um, one of the things that I really like about it is that it's a test of uh, vertical laches. It's not a horizontal lache obstacle. I mean, it's a little bit of horizontal. Obviously, there has to be. But the real test is vertical. It's a four-foot uh, lache up. Uh, and there's you don't see that as often. So I really appreciate just the different dynamic on it. Now, watching the obstacle uh, from this episode, it really seems like the best strategy for this obstacle is first off you want to catch the handlebars with as wide of a grip as possible so you want it if it was a clock you want it on nine and three so you want to grip nine and three you know 180 degrees away from each other because if you have them close like this yet you run the risk of them getting crossed up with on you easily and that would make it easier for you to get flung off of course you're still going to have to deal with the impact but it is what it is but you saw a lot of strategies, you saw people trying to raise their legs to, to limit their speed uh, and, and, and limit the impact, keep those L's. Um, I really like this obstacle. It's, it's very dynamic, very worthy of, of the victory for the obstacle design contest. And then next, uh, speaking of the obstacle design contest, not that this came from the obstacle design contest. You'll see, my, you'll see what I mean in a second. Uh, obstacle 9 was the dungeon. And funny story, I, am, I'm, I was coming up with different ideas for this year's obstacle design contest, seeing if I can finally get an obstacle that is accepted. And admittedly, my, my submissions haven't always been the best. But when I saw the dungeon, my first thought was, oh crap, I'm going to have to come up with a new design. <laughs> they, they, uh, they accidentally came up with uh, well, not accidentally. They came up with a design that I was working on, and you know, Kevin, curse you, Kevin. He knows. Kevin knows who knows who he is. So curse you. But this was actually I really like this obstacle too, just from the dynamic of of it moving. So you got a pegboard. Well, not a pegboard. It's a it's a board of pegs sticking out, which is you know it's I guess anti pegboard or whatever. You got to climb up. The spikes, but as you get to a certain point, about I'd say two thirds the way up, it starts tilting, and then eventually you're going to cause it to tilt, uh, go lock in a 180 position. Um, there's some cool lighting effect when it gets locked into place, and then you have to go across the pegs as they're vertical to get to the end, which involves you lacheing to some uh, pair of handles, like a vertical handle door that you then rotate, uh, spin around to get to the other side. It's good stuff. I really like this obstacle. I really enjoyed it. It's creative. It's dynamic. It's visually interesting. It was good stuff. And then they uh, wrap it all up with the spider trap, which is expected. So, going uh, through this ops, uh, this uh, whatever the hell this is called, the show. 
<laughs> Matisse Hawaii. They start off with Matisse Hawaii, which was shocking to me. Um, now, they showed his run this time, which means no, no, uh, no certain someone in his virtual audience, I suppose. And when I saw he was first, I thought, okay, this could go a few ways. Either he falls early, or he doesn't move on, or he or they're just going to start with a clear, because maybe there was a lot of clears. Uh, turns out he, he ended up failing Corkscrew, which, I, I'm going to be honest, it, it caught me off guard. Didn't think he was going to fail it. I thought he would, if he was going to fail, it would be the ninth obstacle. But he doesn't move on. They actually made a point to mention that he doesn't move on. The only person that they highlighted that got eliminated, which is one of the things that I think uh, the show is missing, is that, uh, especially for this season, having a leaderboard of who moves on to the next round that is shown in progress throughout this episode would have been nice. Yeah, they showed a leaderboard of like the top five times, but that's not what I care about. I want to know who's on the bubble throughout the episode. I want to know who's in danger of being eliminated. And they don't do that enough on this show. And with this season being so you know tightly contested and essentially being a giant tournament instead of the traditional competing to get on to Midori Gamba format, it would have benefited so much. I so hope that when we get to the finals, they give us updates for who's in the top eight and who's on the bubble, and who's at risk of being eliminated. It just, oh, it would have been, it could be so good. It could be so good, but I would have loved to have seen that. But Matisse was, uh, was looking really good, unfortunately. For him, he, it took him a minute to get up the wart's wall. He did the off the hook in one swing. But unfortunately, no one who failed Corkscrew, uh, no men, I should say, who failed Corkscrew are moving on. So it doesn't matter how fast he was. He just did not get far enough. Uh, then they show Nate Hansen. He was the uh, one with the uh, the growth deficiency. Uh, I really liked him. Uh, unfortunately, he just wiped out and burned rubber. Uh, his run was definitely to show the difficulty of one of the earlier obstacles. So that's what it was. Um, and then uh, they showed Sandy Zimmerman, who I'm a big fan of. And um, I almost she was on my list of women who I considered including in, in my top four moving on to the finals. But it ended up not working out, unfortunately. Uh, for my predictions, I should say. <laughs> I should have went with her, clearly. She she looked great. She had the great line in the beginning about like her, her abs uh, make, you know, making it on the course or something like that. Should have, really should have uh, meant this. Uh, should, have, should have wrote no, more notes. I will say she had great banter on this course. One thing that we need in Ninja is more banter. Uh, specifically, ninjas talking to themselves. So like... When she got to burn rubber, she, she gets to the starting platform of that obstacle and she says something like, oh, here we go, or oh God, somebody like that. And then she clears the obstacle and she just goes, oh my God, you know, shocked that she actually did it. And just like that, that's the, that's the kind of, that's the small stuff that I find entertaining more than most of the big stuff, like just the little notes. She uh, unfortunately failed corkscrew. She could not make the transfer to the second handle. But she is moving on. She is the second place of the women. So she is good to go. Looking forward to seeing her in the finals. And then some people who we won't be seeing in the finals. That got fast forward. Zanique Levette failed uh, burn rubber. Um, Glenn Albright, one of the people saved by Jake Murray, failed burn rubber also. And this was at least nice to see. Barry Goers, the other person who, fa uh, who was saved by Jake Murray, ended up failing corkscrew. Now, basically, he says, like, hey, you know what? He did just as well as Matisse Awadi, and, and as we'll soon see, Grant McCartney. He, he was, you know, he didn't qualify for the finals, but he was in the conversation, which is nice to see. Nice to see someone get a second chance and, like, do, you know, decently well. And then, the next run, oh my god, I was so happy to see this. Donovan Matoyer, the classy ninja, finally got to see him run the course. I was so happy to, that he finally, after years of him competing, because he's competed in multiple seasons now, for those of you who don't know, I fi he finally gets a full run featured. He gets, the, he gets the full profile piece. They show his entire run. 
oh, this made me so happy to see. Congratulations, Donovan. Uh, he did the 360 on the Warped Wall. He did it very clean. Like, you know, I, I know he's not the first to do on the show, Kevin Carbone, but uh, with all due respect to Kevin, uh, Donovan did it. Uh, Donovan made it look way nicer than, than Kevin did last year. Unfortunately, I believe Ke- Kevin didn't compete this year due to injury, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, best of luck to him. But Donovan was looking good, boy. I was so, I was just so, so happy. He he handled the corkscrews like a champ with his pulling up, trying to center his, his rotation and all that. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make it up the dungeon. Once he got to that tilting point, his, his grip kind of just gave way. Obviously, um, they weren't allowed to use their feet. You can just tell by looking at, at their technique. Because if they were allowed to use their feet, they would have used it going up. Would have made that op- obstacle a lot easier. But, you know what? He may have failed the dungeon, but he is moving on to the final. So, looking forward to seeing more from you, buddy. In more fast forwards of people who aren't moving on. Caitlin Bergstrom unfortunately failed off the hook. Just bad luck. And then Ryan Lashoff failed corkscrew. Then they did uh, Tyler Gillette. They showed him and his cousin Bill... I've said my, my piece in the past about these types of profiles and how I, I I don't like them because of how NBC presents them. Obviously, him competing in the name of his cousin means a lot to him. I, I, I hope that his cousin is still doing well and still with us today. I, I personally don't know. And I hope that, you know, he, he, things go well for the Gillette family. Unfortunately, you know, it's just a case of I don't particularly uh, care for uh, these types of profile pieces, especially because of how they're presented. The, you know, the, the crying and stuff, it feels, you know, like I've said in the past, it feels exploitative. Now, I will say that, like, it, Henry C. handled it a lot better than they have in the past with certain other types of... Uh, profiles like this but you know that's my opinion on it uh it's nothing against tyler or his cousin i just want to make that clear it's, and you know and this might have been you know his even if it was his decision you know I, I guess it's all about how you present things and this was probably one of the better ways that they've handled it um but it's just in general i i'm not a fan of these type of profiles on the whole yeah that, that's that's just that's just mine that's just me you know that's just my piece Hey everyone, William here, interrupting my review just to give you the comment question of the week. But I'm just here, lying down, watching American Ninja Warrior, which is oddly meta, I think. I don't know. And I couldn't really think of a question last week, but this week I just want to know, how are you doing? You know? Like, how how do you train ninja in this current covid world that we live in and just in general how are you doing you know it's not a it's not been an easy year for a lot of people for a multitude of reasons so yeah how are you doing let me know in the question in the uh comments down below now back to the review later i think tyler's a great competitor also and clearly he's a great guy and cares who cares for his family he looked great on the course and he was the first clear that they showcased uh, super happy for him clearly it meant a lot for him doing it for his cousin uh giving his cousin a show and i uh really like it really like it so good for him good for him um and then in the fast forward segment um they showed ashman conville and i immediately went oh no because she was one of my picks uh to move on and I knew immediately if they were fast following her, that meant she wasn't moving on. And I was right. She failed burn rubber. And I was just like, oh. And Mike Wright isn't moving on either because he failed corkscrew. Grant McCartney was up next. Uh, his intro with him and Zuri swapping places I thought was really funny. Um, his run was just full of sketchiness. He was... He had a sketchy moment on on burn rubber. He had a sketchy moment on sideways. And one of the things that I noticed immediately was Matt mentioning, oh, you know, he he seems to not be moving a lot of urgency or there's a lot of, you know, time ticking away on that clock. And I'm just like, oh, no, not again. 
And even at the top of the warped wall, he's like doing a dance, you know, talking to the commentators. And Matt's like, come on, you got to go. You know, time's ticking away. I'm worried about the clock. And like, Grant, I love you, man. You know, if you're watching this, uh, you should know, <laughs> you should know this by now. This is not the first time this has happened where Matt has been like, oh, you know, he's taking so much time. And you should know better. <laughs> but... Unfortunately, it ended up not making, I guess, well, fortunately, in a way, both unfortunately and fortunately, it ended up not making a difference. He failed Corkscrew. His his arms just looked, it kept twisting on him in such pain, and his weight and height really came at a disadvantage, he seemed. He failed on the final drop, and he was eliminated. Now, I will say, if he cleared that obstacle, he might not have moved on anyway, depending on how long it took everyone else who cleared corkscrew to clear we'll never know because they don't tell us this information <laughs> half the time but it was very um you know, very sad ending for the island ninja he is out also uh, also not make moving on to the finals was both abel gonzalez and kevin bull who got fast forward at this point and was shown failing the core screw i just i i don't understand them fast forwarding kevin bull both times very disappointed in that cameron baumgarter was the next uh point that they showed uh really you know what i will say i really liked i really liked this uh profile piece i don't know just something about overcoming adversity overcoming his own personal adversity from a from a health standpoint um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I'll admit I'm not always the biggest fan of the sappy stuff, but this one I liked. I like. I'll make this. I'll make a, an exception for this one. And one of the things that was noted was I think it was Joe Morosky. I wrote the quote. I didn't say wrote who said it. <laughs> I think it was Joe Morosky who said that Cameron is a future superstar. And immediately that made me think. Hmm. I remember back in the day. In season seven, it might have been Joe who said this, but when when Jeff Britton was was being shown, and they did a profile piece for him, and this was before they really had featured him before, I think it might have been Joe who said like this guy, this is a guy who can win it all, and then he won the season. <laughs> so I'm thinking they, there might be some foreshadowing here. Cameron, we'll have to see. I'm not, when I make my predictions for who I think was going to make the top eight, I, Cameron Cameron's now in the conversation just because. Uh, I'm just thinking, oh my god, I'm just thinking about, about all the editing and stuff. But he was perfect on the corkscrew. I, I made sure to make a note of that. His technique and the way he fell was just perfect on that. No problems whatsoever. He ended up clearing the course five and a half minutes, which is uh, about uh, 50 seconds faster than Ty Tyler did. But Cameron just looked great. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Freeman because I think we're going to see some good things. Um, also, who got fast forwarded? Rui Yori, unfortunately, you know, had bad luck on off the hook. He's eliminated. Um, and then Jackson Twait, who this is the second time he's getting fast forwarded, ended up failing the spider trap, which was very surprising that they did that. Uh, yeah, it's it's so weird. I think I feel like Rui Yori's team really kind of disintegrated the whole notion that uh, the captains picked their teams because Rui Ori, um, you know, let, you know, Jackson Twait, he made it to the power tower last year and the qualifiers, it, you know, I feel like he would have been more likely to be a captain than Rue. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. I mean, you know, Rue's a great guy. But I just find it very bizarre of the presentation of Jackson. And I think, um, you yeah, know, Jackson's really good. But the fact that they fast forward him twice now leads me to believe that we're not going to see him in the in uh, the top eight. Then they showed uh, Jamie Ron, no profile, half you know they showed a mid run episode uh, part five obstacle five, a lot of a uh, lot of mid runs at this point, and I think uh, this is where the editor was like, okay, we we got to fit runs in, but we don't have enough time, so we're cutting we're cutting runs in half, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, very bizarre. Uh, I don't like showing Rudd's mid-progress, but I get why they do it. Uh, I just wish they'd be better editors. Uh, Jamie, one of the things I noted that Jamie just flew up the salmon ladder, and he ended up finishing the corkscrew, and 
Unfortunately, he ended up failing the door portion of dungeon. He got through, well, seemingly the hard part, but he just slid down the door. Uh, I think he, he might have missed uh, one of his hands. Who knows, but, you know, at the end of the day, he's moving on to the finals. Uh, happy I picked him. In other fast-forwarded, uh, Gabriel Hotskins failed Corkscrew, which means he's not moving on. Daniel Gill... There's, like, nothing really to say. They just showed, started him mid-run, if I remember correctly, because I didn't write anything for his profile piece. Start, showed him off, started him at sideways, and he cleared in 438, which is, I believe, the, yeah, second fastest uh, finish of the night. And he looked really good. Daniel Gill looks really good on a lot of these courses, and I don't know what else there is to say, necessarily, because he was perfect. Just really darn good. And then they showed Alyssa Beard. They did a profile about her doing rote teaching and the uh, uh, about the difficulties of remote teaching. I, I just I cannot imagine what school teachers are going through right now uh, with everything going on with COVID and, and stuff like that. Uh, much respect to everyone who's trying their best to make this work. Uh, on a personal level, I am so glad that I am no longer a student because I don't know how I'd be able to survive uh, a school year <laughs> remotely like this. Uh, but that's just me. But shocking. She failed clockwork. The third obstacle. And I, I literally, that was, that was like the, the most shocking moment of the night, um, I would say. Um, I, had a, I just, I just, just stood up. I was like, what? Yeah, she she missed the third she missed the third bar, and just like that, she's out. Also failing uh, clockwork was Jonathan Horton, the you know Olympic gymnast who fell off the first one. Very bizarre. They showed Jake Murray. I feel like they should have cut the profile piece down for this so we can see more of his run. Because. Basically, it's him talking about him hanging out with Hunter Gerard and Kyle Soderman. And were they even in this season of American Ninja Warrior? I'm going to be honest, I don't remember right now. I'm going to look really dumb. Because I'm gonna like, oh, did they even compete? I, I don't remember seeing their names. So, very bizarre. Like, they're the blonde boys. And, like, they went into a cave, and then there were spiders, and I'm just like, you could have cut, like, half of this out, like, and, and showed more of his run. Because they started him mid-run at sideways, and it's like, you could have showed the first half, really. You could have showed the first half. Really wish you did. It took him a minute ten to get up the wart wall, and he ended up clearing the whole course. And then at the end, he said, I'm hungry, and he actually finished with the fastest time of the night, Really, really good run. Really clean run. I think Jake is a strong contender. Uh, I picked him to win the whole thing so far. That might change. Who knows? We'll, we'll have to see. And then uh, we're going to wrap things. The final fast-forward segment. Some surprising fast-forwards. Flip Rodriguez got fast-forwarded. I'm guessing th there might have been... Drew might have been on his virtual sideline, which is why he got fast-forwarded. He ended up failing the dungeon, and then Adam Rail got fast forward also, but he ended up clearing the whole thing. That was nice to see. Jess Lebrecht, final female, in between her coming to the start line and, and her starting her run, they showed Chris DeGangi in a fast forward segment, failing the dungeon, and all I can think is like, come on, man. <laughs> I, Chris is a talented ninja who's been competing since, I believe, season four. Like... He deserves more. He deserves to be shown more. Show his runs, his full runs, more often. Like you're just. I don't. I. I, I want to make sure I put this the right way. But remember how like I talked about in the past how like they they reduce Brent Stephenson to Brent's girlfriend or Brent's ex girlfriend. They're reducing Chris Ganji to just being Jesse LeBrecht's fiance. It's like I I know they're happy together and all that, but like come on. Just show the guys run every once in a while. He's more than just the fiancé of the more popular ninja that you feature more. Maybe he'd be more popular if you featured him more. Just saying. But 
Jess Lebrecht also ended up failing the dungeon. She looked great on the course. Uh, you know, obviously one of the, the, the top female competitors, her and the other Jesse, are easily the, t- the, the top two female overall. It's a shame that Jesse Lebrecht hasn't cleared stage one yet and doesn't have the opportunity to do so this season. But, and, and okay, before anyone comments, in the regular season. Okay, I'm glad I said that. But, it, uh, unfortunately, she just slipped off the dungeon. But she's moving on, so that's good. And then the final, the final run was Jody Avila, and immediately this raised eyebrows because, like, they have never given Jody this much attention before, and the fact they gave him the final run, the final spot again. Like, I understand them. The, I understand them giving him the final spot in episode one, and there was you know weirdness with editing around Drew, but like he was the fastest run if you don't count the one that they had to cut (laughs) and he ended up winning the power tower but you'll never know unless you you're hearing it from outside sources so i thought does he have the fastest run of the night again is that why no no he he failed dungeon i mean he's still moving on but he failed dungeon Uh, one other thing that's worth mentioning is that his wife ended up having to go home uh, and go back to work so unfortunately she had to forfeit her semi-final spot and Rougette, uh, the other person that Jody, uh, uh, the, the other, wow, the other person that Rougette saved, um, didn't get shown at all. I'm assuming he was in this episode. I could be wrong, but unfortunately, uh, A and W Nation doesn't have him listed at all because they're pretending that the power tower never happened in the first episode. It's Oh, man, this whole thing is a mess when it comes to the editing. Like, poor, poor Rogette not getting his run shown at all or even acknowledged. Ugh, who knows. Uh, and then, so yeah, it was so bizarre having him in the final run and yet still failing. Maybe they just wanted to keep the element of surprise. He's still moving on. I'm thinking, I got a feeling that they might, you know, he might be going far in the finals. That... That's my theory, at least. He, he might be someone to look in, into. I would say my stock in Jody potentially winning the season has risen just from the editing. And if they did this literally just to throw pe- people like me off, then congratulations, you did your job correctly because it's working. Other than that, uh, yeah, it was overall a good episode. Bizarrely, John Alexis Jr. got completely cut again, even though he is moving on to the finals. He failed the dungeon. This was so bizarre he got cut both time both in episode one and in this episode the amount of people who have been completely cut is so small in this season and the fact that he's one of them and he had happened to him twice now blows my mind what did this guy do i don't know obviously it wasn't something so awful that they had to completely remove him from the show because then he wouldn't be on the leaderboard they would have just made crap up (laughs) <laughs> so i'm at a loss here when it comes to john i feel sorry for john but overall it was a good episode uh one last topic um the song and the intro that they did for the episode was terrible but i i've ranted about their song choices and editing for their intro sequences uh much many many times in the past and i don't feel like repeating myself but on a whole, the semifinals, this was a fun episode. Some really cool obstacle designs, some, some new obstacles. Unfortunately, Sideways was there, but, you know, I'm willing to forgive and forget because it's a 10 obstacle course. But let's go through the results. So in total, two people failed off the hook, two failed clockwork, two, four failed burn rubber. Uh, no one failed Sideways, Shrinking Steps, the Wart Wall, or the Salmon Ladder. Nine failed Corkscrew. Seven failed the dungeon, one failed the spider trap, and five people cleared. So, going through the full results, moving on to the finals. Your first half of the final round of American Ninja Warrior. Fourteen people will be competing. They are Jake Murray, Daniel Gill, Cameron Baumgartner, Tyler Gillette, and Adam Rail, who all cleared. And then Jackson Twait, Jody Avila, Donovan Matoyer, John Alexis Jr., Flip Rodriguez, Chris DeGangi, and Jamie Ron, who all failed the dungeon. And your top two women are Jesse Lebrecht, who failed the dungeon, and Sammy Zimmern, who failed 
corkscrew. So that is our first 14. Next week, we're going to learn of the 12 to 14 people who will be joining them in the final round. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we know we got some big names left. And uh, unfortunately, one name who will be redacted once again. But we'll get to that bridge and cross it eventually. Uh, one important programming note is that American Ninja Warrior is moving to Wednesdays next week. And so my review... Uh, we'll be going up on either Friday or Saturday. Uh, I don't know. It kind of depends on my schedule because Wednesday is not a good night for me to watch it. I won't be able to watch it live. So I'm going to have to watch it Thursday and either get it, like, you know, rush out the review for Friday or get it out Saturday. I don't know what's going to happen. So we'll play it by ear. But that is everything for me. What did you think of this episode? Let me know in the comments below. And thank you all very much for watching. Make sure you're subscribed for more A&W reviews just like this. And check out some of my past reviews. See you all later, everyone. And enjoy American Ninja Warrior still. See you next time.